Hello, I'm Annie Graham Larkin, Executive Director of the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum. Welcome to Mine Accidents and Safety at Bisbee, Arizona with Richard W. Graham IV. Thank you to our program sponsor, the Arizona Historical Society, as well as our members and donors who enable the museum to provide free online programming and fulfill the organization's mission to discover history, explore Bisbee's past today. To learn how you can assist the museum in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit bisbeemuseum.org. On Saturday, May 4th at 11 a.m., the museum will host a free online program, Preserving Place and Empowering Community, the Past, Present, and Future of Camp Naco, with Rebecca Orozco and R. Brooks Jeffrey. Please visit the event section of the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum's Facebook page for more information. All right. Richard W. Graham IV was born in Bisbee, Arizona. By the age of six, he was collecting minerals underground with his father and twin brother. Minerals and mining were the focal points of his youth, with many hundreds of hours spent underground in Bisbee and other Western mining areas collecting minerals and mining artifacts. In 1986, along with his twin, he collected what is surely Bisbee's finest cuprite specimen, along with exceptional examples of some of the rarest copper minerals. Rich has worked in mines in Alaska, Colorado, California, and New Mexico, and later he worked in, the Bisbee, in Bisbee at the Queen Mine Tour as a guide, where his knowledge base was put to full use. Because of the difficult times for the domestic mining industry, Rich switched from a mining major to education. He earned a degree in education from the University of Arizona in 1999. He's been teaching for 25 years in Sierra Vista, Arizona. During this time, Rich has authored and co-authored several books and articles, including The Mineralogy of Bisbee, Volumes 1 and 2, Seven Bells, Mine Accidents at Bisbee, Arizona, and Forgotten Caves of Bisbee, Arizona. And if you would like to ask Rich a question today during the program, please type your questions into the Q&A chat box and we'll gather those questions to share with him at the, at the end of the presentation. Also a link to the recording of today's program will be sent to all of our Zoom registrants later today. And with that, I'd like to welcome you, Rich. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Annie. Um, so, and good afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking about the, as it said, the mine safety and accidents at Bisbee, Arizona. Um, growing up in Bisbee, um, I used to hang out, well, with a lot of old miners. And they always used to tell me Bisbee was the safest mine in the world. And then later on, I got to work with uh, some exceptional miners in Bisbee, like Pete Allier, Toby Valdez, uh, Al Haralas, and, and a large number of others. And again, they would tell me that Bisbee was the safest mine in the world. And I had already worked underground at this time, and, and I knew guys like Pete Allier and Al Haralas were far better miners than I could ever dream of being. So I, I took that information and, and as, as true and valid. And I'm not sure it's not true and valid, but I came up with a lot of questions because as I started researching Bisbee mining history, not really accidents themselves, I started discovering all of these accidents that occurred in Bisbee. And it turned out to be hundreds of accidents and uh, well over 350. Um, and so I became very interested in what was going on here. Why was it I being told this? And um, the death certificates and coroner's reports were telling a slightly different story. Well, a dramatically different story. So we're gonna look at why, in a sense, the miners in the later years could say that and rightly argue that. And then uh, we can compare to sort of the teens and the twenties, which were actually the really dangerous years um, to be working underground in Bisbee. So the first recorded accident in Bisbee uh, occurred in 1881, and it was uh, Stephen uh, Bradish. As you can see up in here, we have the Copper Queen mine uh, located up on the hillside. Uh, the glory hole is really difficult to detect, but it is there at this time. 
Um, the Copper Queen in 1881 had reached a depth where ventilation was becoming a problem. So the Copper Queen decided to sink a small shaft uh, to provide uh, uh, circulation, air circulation. And Stephen Bradish was, was part of that. Uh, they were sinking down and they had blasted. And Stephen Bradish decided to enter the shaft and go down it um, too quickly after they blasted. So he got partly way down the shaft and he passed out because of the powder gases. He fell by some miracle. That final blast had blasted into the tunnel below. And so when he fell, his, hell, his head fell through the, the little opening that they had blasted into the tunnel below, and his shoulders got caught on the edge of the uh, hole. He was largely unharmed and only suffered um, uh, bruised shoulders. The first fatal accident actually did not occur until 10 years after the Copper Queen had really begun true mining. And that was uh, J.L. Jones. Uh, they were mining uh, probably around B level in the Copper Queen uh, shaft, the incline shaft. And uh, they were driving two tunnels. One of them was uh, using actually a steam drill, which is unusual. It was a very early effort in Bisbee to go to mechanized drills. And in the area that uh, Jones was working in, they'd been hand drilling. Uh, he walked back into the drift and he began digging and he struck a misfire, which is an unexploded charge. And it detonated and he was able to crawl partly way out, uh, but he died soon after. Uh, so let's look at what was going on here. Um, and even as a kid I, and, and a young miner, uh, everybody told you it was so much more dangerous in, in the old days. But if you look at this chart I made, you'll notice there's not a fatal accident until 10 years. And then it, it slowly, gradually starts to climb. And then you reach the turn of the century, and then it starts to, to, to really become substantial. And then in 1918, we peak, and then it begins to drop off very rapidly after that. And then in the last few years of mining in Bisbee, no one was uh, killed underground. Now, we have to be a little forgiving in the 1918. The 1918 is, is when true mining began in the Sacramento pit. The Sacramento pit did start in 1917, but the actual heavy mining began in, in 1918, and seven of these were actually killed in the open pit mine. Okay, and that was due to unexperienced or inexperience with open pit mining. Uh, so, but even if you eliminate those seven, you still have a substantial number of killed uh, miners being killed. Now, one of the things that we have to understand about this time period is that basically, if you weren't killed underground on a day where news was sort of scarce. Um, it probably didn't make it to the newspaper. Um, yeah, if you were killed on the 4th of July, they covered all the 4th of July events, and you might get a notice when they were going to bury you. So being killed or injured in the mine did not necessarily make the newspaper. Most of them did, but not all of them. And so these numbers uh, are constantly changing um, as, they, as they increase slightly uh, because more accidents are are uncovered uh, but it's a it's a difficult uh, challenge but i've always wondered or always wondered what was going on to cause the increase in accidents because there's a, it's a substantial increase so looking at this my proposed thought is that it was in the early days in mining mining was slow and tedious hand drilling um, there was some pick work. If you were in soft oxides or, or clays, you could use a pick. But these miners were progressing so slowly. You know, we're talking a couple feet a week. Um, and the miners also had a much higher skill level on reading the rock that was around them. Part of that was is because if they could remove a rock without drilling and blasting it out, it was so much easier for them. 
because they're drilling one, maybe two blast holes a day. It also caused their blast to be much smaller. They would shoot two, three, four holes, not like 30, 40 holes that would be uh, done in the later years. So we're, we're seeing mining progressing very slowly uh, at this time. But soon, around 1900, things began to change. Pneumatic drills were adopted and they were very successful. Um, where one or two holes would have been common to drill in fairly hard rock in, in 1890, you were going to drill 20 holes or 30 holes with a pneumatic drill at the same time. And your blast rounds, instead of two or three holes, were going 25, 30 holes, uh, depending on, on the ground. You know, the miner had to make that uh, decision. And so everything was moving. The tonnages were becoming massive. The mine had been redesigned in, to, in around 1908 to produce an effective haulage system. So they were definitely looking at mass tonnages. Another factor that was coming in, the mines were aging. You know, in 1910, you know, they've been mining for 30 years in Bisbee, yet they were still using some of the haulage waves and some of the main shafts that were 30 years old. And so they were starting to wear and and some major ground movement was occurring. They lost the Holbrook shaft in 1906. It, it collapsed completely or the upper section, the first hundred feet or so caved in because of the mine workings around it caving in. And as it says on the slide in 1916, Bisbee produced as much copper as the entire United States did in 1906 to give you a comparison. And this was much lower grade ore you know, ore grades had been falling uh, for some time. So it was a huge tonnage that they were moving. Now, Bisbee did have decent hospital, uh, decent hospital, the Copper Queen Hospital, and then later, of course, the Calumet in Arizona. The Copper Queen Hospital, which is seen down below here, was conveniently located sort of in a central position in the mines. You can see the spray in the background and then a little bit to the right of the photo would have been the two Holbrook shafts and then the czar, which would have been about a thousand feet from the hospital. And then on the other side, you would have had the a gardener, which would have uh, to the left rather, would have been about a thousand feet away too. And then maybe 1500 to 2000 feet, you would have had the wall. So they were pretty centrally located and they were, uh, consistently receiving miners being delivered uh, from these mines. If you look at this, this is a copy out of the Copper Queen Hospital records that the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum uh, retains. You can see in the records uh, here, carried from the spray, carried from the Holbrook, carried from the Czar, carried from the Lowell spray, Holbrook. So you can see in this one month, they had several, uh, men that were taken to the hospital from the mines. And this does not include the men that were taken to the dispensaries. The Copper Queen dispensaries would handle more minor injuries. So these guys had to have been pretty well uh, busted up uh, or there were some deep concerns. Now in saying that, uh, one of the things we have to understand is that a lot of this is pre-antibiotic. So some of the concerns that we have today, or some of the injuries would be considered huge today, uh, were not necessarily a big deal then. And then other injuries, which we would not consider uh, much of a big deal, were huge then, like stepping on a nail. Now, if you stepped on a nail underground, it was not you know, your common 8D, 16D nails. These are uh, 40D, 50D, these are almost spikes. Uh, and they were very worried about septicemia. That was a big deal at this time. And they did have miners die from septicemia, uh, from minor cuts. Uh, versus at this time, if, if you lost a finger, uh, you know, in 1907, it was a, a deal, but not huge. Uh, you know, today you lose a finger in an industrial accident. It, it, it's, it's quite the... Uh, serious accident. At that time, uh, it was more considered far more mild. 
uh, type of accident. Uh, but all of the hospital records that they retain uh, look like this, page after page. I believe they go from 1907 to about 1932. I'd have to double check on the last date. But they're pretty well filled up with, with minors in there. And it does give the, uh, the information on, on what the injury was and how long they stayed in the hospital and if it was fatal. One of the most common uh, type of accidents under uh, underground is the fall ground. And this is can go from the Hollywood type cave in to the far more common uh, where just a single rock or three or four rocks falls and uh, injures or kills the person. Uh, many men were killed by like a 30 pound rock that fell 20 feet and just hit them in the wrong place. Uh, you can see a safety photo right here where they hang a, or hung a, a fake rock on a string to show that you needed to keep your uh, the area you're working uh, underneath clean of loose rocks. And something like that uh, can cause some serious damage, particularly if it's ore, because the ore, uh, sulfide ores in particular, are, are really heavy. Uh, and then you can see... Uh, it's actually the same crosscut, two different ends of it, a more Hollywood type cave in where it's really fine, lots of broken timber. And you can see a section of crosscut taking some heavy weight. Now, it looks horrible, but to be honest, it's probably not nearly as bad as it looks because this timber is so broken. If, if it was really taking a lot of weight, it would have caved in completely uh, by now. But you can see it. You know, these this post is broken here, and they tried to repair it, give it a temporary repair by nailing this lagging on, uh, but it wasn't strong enough. And you can see a cap broken back here. Uh, they were trying to keep this tunnel open uh, after it began caving. And uh, we can look at some ex examples of here of two accident sites. Um, the first one is sort of a miraculous accident. It, it's up in a stope on the 3100 level Campbell. And these beams here, they're to help provide temporary protection in an area that has been freshly exposed, freshly blasted. They hang these, they slide them forward on these, what are called boom hangers. And then you build timber across the end of it. so. The ceiling, you're pr theoretically protected from any falling debris before you can uh, secure the area and make it safe. Now, in this case, uh, H. Horton was working back there and it failed. Uh, and it was an absolute miracle. I don't know if you can see it. His mine light is right there. Those boulders right in this area hit him and they tore his lamp off completely, off his lamp belt. And miraculously, he was largely unhurt. I don't see how he was unhurt, but according to the reports, uh, he only suffered minor injuries. And um, this one right here, it was not so good. Uh, they had put their booms out to start, and the man, uh, Sandoval, Mr. Sandoval, was trying to put in the boards that go across to help support the area. And this boulder came down and came through, and that accident was fatal. Uh, unfortunately, let's see if I can move it. His hard hat is right here. Uh, it probably was was put there when they 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 removed him. Um, now, fall of ground uh, accidents, whether it's just a few rocks falling or just thousands of tons, were fairly common. And um, so you see a lot of them underground. And uh, okay, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So timber, because Bisbee had a notoriously heavy ground, timbering uh, was essential. And they used square set stoping, which is an extremely expensive way to mine. For every 480 tons, they used enough wood to build a 2,400 square foot house. Yeah, and at the end it was, and even at the end of mining, they were using 33 uh, board feet uh, per ton, which is 
for 480 tons, it's just over 15,000 square feet of timber. So this timber here you're looking at is not some vast storage uh, material for, for months. This is probably about a one month supply. And this does not include um, the materials stored underground in the timber stations. So in two to three weeks, this would be largely depleted and, and of course they would have had shipments in. Now Timberman, you, you might hear about Timberman and these two guys up here are Timberman, but these guys are going back and they're repairing the mine. Okay, Timberman just typically repair, restore, reopen workings that have caved in. The miners themselves typically do most of their own timbering. Uh, but older guys um, that want a little bit slower pace, they ended up as, as, as timbermen like these two guys right here. Also often mistaken for a, a cave-in is actually a shoot accident. And it's hard to see because this is actually two, there were two shoots here at least, if not three. Okay, now we can see the chute door right here. And in this little drawing, we see a similar chute door. Behind this is a shaft, normally at least 100 feet tall, sometimes a couple thousand feet tall. And it's filled with rock and they pull their mine cars underneath it. They open the doors and the rock pours out. And when they get their car full, they shot it. Well, that works well most of the time. Uh, but in this case, it, I know it's hard for you to see, but that was very fine, sticky, wet mud inside that chute. And so in the second chute, the one right behind the one that we can see, it overflowed the chute door and it just filled almost the entire crosscut. Except the nice thing for most people is that this opening right here, I don't, there's an opening and it looks like it goes all the way over to the crosscut behind. And that's nice because the time I got shot caught in a, a chute cave in, it wasn't muddy like this. It was very fine dirt. It actually lifted me and floated me up into this corner and then it stopped filling. And that happens to a number of guys that their rest, they're saved because when it starts filling, they get lifted up into that corner and they're protected. They may, they're probably pinned. I know I was pinned in there and had to be, had to have guys get me out. But uh, you're relatively safe up in that corner. It's a, a secure place. Now, this guy right here was VR Rodriguez. Um, it's unknown. We know he was in an accident. We know he was injured, but the details are are unknown. Uh, this is a fatal accident that happened in 1950 or about 1917 or 18, actually. Uh, Lewis Hart was working uh, with his uh, brother. Uh, Lee Hart, and they were up in a raise, and they were at the very top, and they were getting ready to uh, load uh, the blast holes. And Lewis was just below his brother, about one ladder below his brother Lee. Lee was putting in the um, explosives. He had loaded one hole, uh, but he needed light. He couldn't see to load the other hole. So Lewis climbed up and sat down on a timber and was using his carbide light to um, light uh, or illuminate uh, Lee's work. And suddenly about 200 pounds of rock fell and it broke Lewis's back. And he was taken to the hospital, but it, it was uh, a fatal accident. Uh, now understand that there were hundreds and hundreds of men killed. So we're just gonna go through a, a brief few and certain time periods, like in the 40s, late 30s, and early 50s, the information is extremely difficult to find. Um, so uh, hundreds of acts, thousands of accidents have, have gone un, unrecorded largely. Uh, so uh, if you don't hear of a relative's accident, that's not uncommon because there were so many. and they just at certain times they weren't a big deal or if they were the information has been lost to time another uh major um a form of accidents was was blasting accidents almost all of the blasting accidents involved a misfire 
which means when a hole fails to detonate. And that's what happened in this uh, photograph right here. He was drilling. Uh, he probably should have known better because it was pretty obvious that there was a misfire. Uh, the way you can tell that there's this big hump of rock right here uh, that's left over from the blast. That is a major indication that a misfire occurred there. Uh, he made the poor choice of drilling into that, and he drilled into uh, a hole that was still partially loaded. Uh, this would have been a, a gelatin dynamite in this case. So the dynamite itself probably wasn't the problem. It's just the dynamite had a blasting cap in it. And when that blasting cap detonated, it would have detonated the dynamite in the hole. And it would have been just like standing in front of a shotgun barrel. Barrel. Now, it is unknown which miner uh, drilled here. It's just the photograph and the notation that it was a missed hole remains. Uh, you can see an, a missed hole that still remains in the Georgia Tunnel. You can see a stick of a Apache gelatin dynamite. And you can see the fuse coming out. And it's... Probably, well, probably 100 years old now because that was driven in the 20s. But blasting accidents were not uncommon. You can see 51 were killed. Um, but normally it was drilling into a misfire. Um, there are a couple accidents where they don't understand what happened, where an entire case of dynamite detonated. Um, but there's no real clue what went on because typically dynamite is not particularly dangerous, particularly the more modern you know, from the teens and 20s, uh, which were a lot of gelatin dynamites at that point, or ammonium gelatin dynamites if it's a little later. Uh, you can see a more modern one, one of the mines I worked at. You can see this big area right here. These were caused by a cutoff, which means when they blasted, the first holes, which were over here, when they detonated, they cut off the, in this case, it was shock tubes, or possibly the primer cord, because uh, I didn't drill that round. Uh, it, it cut off the uh, the um, the shock tubes eventually, and so the caps didn't detonate. So all those holes misfired right here. And you can see uh, a couple guys uh, getting ready to uh, reshoot those holes. They're reloading them, and you can see it uh, right there. Uh, reloaded with the primer cord all bright and colorful um, and the yellow are the shock tubes and they're going to reshoot it which is the common method but see even today you still get a fair number of, of misfires when they were drilling uh, the openings for Karchner caverns they were having issues with the bottom drill holes along the bottom of the tunnel uh, misfiring uh, again cut off when the, the other holes uh, cut off the way for the bottom holes to detonate. Here's um, uh, Joseph Pulaski. He's buried in Bisbee. Uh, and uh, he was um, killed when he drilled into a misfire. Now, he made a really bad decision, but there were other circumstances involved. Uh, they were in the Gardner mine on the 600 level, and they were right up against the property line. And so they were mining very close to the um, Irish Mag. And the Irish Mag guys were, were mining uh, right up against the property line too. And when they would blast, they happened to be blasting at the same time as the guys on the Phelps Dodge side. And so it became confusing when they were counting their misfires is what at least the coroner's report said. And it makes sense. They just not unexpected that they would be blasting at very close to the same time, if not at the exact time, you know, at the end of shift. So what had happened is when Joseph Pulowski and his uh, partner, uh, Mabry, uh, saw on the uh, misfire board uh, that three misfires had been reported from their work area, which was uh, raised. And they climbed up in the rays and they could see the three misfired holes because the fuse was still hanging out of them. They were very evident. Uh, and those were the ones that were reported. Unfortunately, he didn't realize this. There was a fourth misfire, but it was on the opposite side of the rays. Uh, Mabry went down to get explosives to reshoot those 
three holes that they had found. Um, and Joseph made the poor decision of trying to drill a blast hole on the other side of the rays. And when he did that, he drilled right into the misfire, crushed the cap, and the hole detonated. And uh, he was blinded in one eye, and a, an arm was broken. Uh, but he died from shock at the uh, Copper Queen Hospital uh, a little while later. Shaft accidents, uh, these were horrible. And I'm not sure I'm going to go into a lot of detail on these because they get real gruesome real quick. Uh, you can see the early cages right here. This is a triple deck cage at the Gardener. And you can see when that cage or elevator if you so to speak are going up and down if you reach out at all you're going to touch the walls of that shaft and that's where that became a problem uh, uh, guys like this would be you know they'd have their lunchbox and the lunchbox would get caught on a timber or on the wall of the shaft and it would yank them right out of that cage so these cages were extremely dangerous and uh, as it says, 60 men were killed that way. Uh, one guy hadn't been underground two hours before he was killed on a cage. He was a brand new miner. He went down and then uh, he ended up on the wrong level of the mine. So the boss put him on a cage and set him up to the level he belonged. But between in those couple hundred feet he was going up, it, it is suspected that his lunchbox or his clothing caught on the timber and he was uh, uh, killed. But he'd only been underground just a couple hours uh, when that occurred. Uh, here's another thing that, that was an extremely serious safety violation and these guys are, are doing it. This is at the Oliver mine. They're riding the cages with materials and there's these two uh, Square set posts, they could be shaft posts. It's, it's hard to tell because the guys are in front of them. Uh, riding um, cages with equipment or materials was extremely forbidden because if they were to shift and the material, like one of those timbers, shift and get caught on another shaft timber while that was moving, everybody in that cage would have been killed. Um, it would have kicked, kicked out and thrown the men out of that cage. And that happened a number of times. Drill steels were notoriously bad for that. The guy would decide to ride a cage with a drill steel and the drill steel would slip and get caught on the timber and then um, it, it would kill them. But um, the distance between the base of the cage and the timber in many cases is just a couple inches. So it was not a particularly pretty thing when you got drug out of that cage because you had to go through those the machine pulled you through those few inches. So it, it really rather gruesome, very unpleasant way to, to die. Open holes were another uh, way that uh, men were killed underground. Uh, you can see a nice large open hole right here. That is probably at least 100 feet deep. It's a standard raise. It looks like a small transfer raise. Um, and so this one here is totally unprotected. It's from a safety photo. Um, and it was to imply that those need to be protected. Uh, this is sort of a weird photo. You're actually looking down this. Um, and that's the uh, Hargis incline up in the Higgins mine. And uh, so a large number of men, The one of the youngest men killed underground in Bisbee was uh, died from falling down a hole. It was uh, Charles Huber, very popular um, captain of the track team type of guy. He, when he was 16 years old, he asked his dad if he could get a job underground. His dad said, fine. And just a few days after his 17th birthday, he was dumping a wheelbarrow and he fell into uh, the top of a raise and uh, he went head first. So it was not a, a pleasant end there. There were other hazards too. And the one that threw me off is stabbings. I mean, so many people got stabbed. 
Uh, I think when people got angry and they had that convenient candlestick, because it's almost always a candlestick, um, they would get in a fight underground and uh, that did not end well, typically. Now, most of the guys were injured. One was killed, but they couldn't prove that he actually was stabbed by the candlestick. They are questioning whether he fell on his candlestick. And then another one was reported in critical condition, but there are no, I could not find a death certificate. So there were possibly two, one definite that died from being stabbed with a candlestick. Um, mules, uh, yeah, they were, they were problematic. There are two definite miners that were killed by mules. One was kicked in the head. And the other one, uh, what happened was it was Edward Johnson. Now, there were three Edward Johnsons killed in, in uh, Bisbee, two Finnish and one Swedish. And it, what happened is the mule got startled and it pulled a mine car and the mine car dumped on top of it. Um, but startled mules caused many injuries, you know, broken hands and things of that nature. But there were two that were definitely uh, killed uh, by that. Electrocution wasn't too uncommon, uh, largely because there's a trolley, well, a trolley line right across here. And it's a bare copper wire. And this safety photo is showing where somebody didn't want to crawl around the mine car. He decided to go over the top of it and... It was showing what would happen if you touched that trolley wire. It, it would uh, likely kill you. Not always, but likely kill you. So let's look at the safety program. The safety program actually was borrowed from e El Paso and Southwestern Railroad. It was not a Phelps Dodge. Um, well, I guess technically because Phelps Dodge owned the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad. But it wasn't a mining development. Um, Edward Tinker uh, was very concerned about the number of men being killed in railroad accidents. So he got really involved as, as an employee of El Paso and Southwestern Railroad. And it was so successful that the Copper Queen said, hey, we want to borrow this. And so they started developing a safety program. So in 1912, the safety program was being developed and they chose the exact right people to do it. Uh, Wallace McKeon uh, became the, the first safety inspector, um, but he was to retire soon and be taken by somebody, some of you might know, which was William Bill Gidley. Uh, he was still around in the early 1960s and he was a safety supervisor um, and he was Wallace McKeon's uh, safety. Uh, replacement. And then Joseph P. Hodgson, the mine superintendent, also a strong believer in mine safety. And they came up with this idea that safety wasn't just about being a miner. They wanted to have the wives and the miners involved because uh, they would suffer as well if a miner was killed or injured. They wanted the children involved. They wanted it to be a community effort on mine safety. And this was the Copper Queen's viewpoint. And they worked very hard. They were taking photographs of mine, mine accidents underground, uh, which continued right up until the end. Uh, from 1913 to the end of mining, they were taking photographs underground of accident sites and then examples of, of what you should or should not be doing while you were underground uh, to help promote safety. Um, they were having uh, community events, a lot of smokers where they would give out cigars uh, and, and just numerous events. Now, the Calumet in Arizona uh, went a different route and it was not successful at all, really. Uh, they knew that they had to get into the safety uh, business uh, for their miners, uh, but they chose a sort of a dark way, I would think. What they did they made sort of an antagonistic thing. They put these boxes out and they were you were supposed to report if your boss made you do anything unsafe or report another worker that was doing something unsafe. Uh, their philosophy was that the bosses would resent having to work safe, safely. So it wasn't this community well bonded uh, 
effort. It was, you know, sort of deceitful and sly and you can get even with your boss this way. So their um, safety program really died out. And, and when the merger occurred, it was the Copper Queen safety methods that survived. And then the uh, Calumet in Arizona's ideas just sort of faded away. Um, one of the big things, and I, I briefly talked about this, is schools. They taught mine safety classes in the Bisbee schools. And people would wonder, well, why are they teaching safety <laughs> in the elementary schools and uh, the junior high schools and things like that? We have to remember, at 14, a lot of these guys and were looking at getting jobs in the mines. Now, and... Here's a picture you can see. You can see the Holbrook number one shaft in the background. So this has to be pre-1907. I would guess about 1905 because they see no indications of the Holbrook number two being built. Uh, this shaft were to, was caved in in 1906 and they lost it. But you can see some of these guys here. They're mighty young. Okay, uh, three of them. Now, you can tell that these guys are working on the surface. They aren't covered in candle wax like the miners are. So these guys were probably working in, in the sawmills and blacksmith shops and things of that nature. But by the time they were 16, you know, they were ready to go underground. And now they did uh, give them light duty jobs underground. You know, they weren't full bore miners. They were most commonly tool nippers where they were delivering tools and sharpened steels and things of that nature to the miners underground. And then as they got older, uh, they would work themselves into a, a mining position. Um, the youngest person killed underground in Bisbee um, was a young man, um, uh, Bowman, uh, who was killed, but he was killed riding a sinking bucket. So when there's developing shafts, they often do not have an elevator or a cage. They just have a large bucket where they're hiding or hauling up the rock. And so the miners would not ride in the bucket themselves. They would stand on the edge of the bucket and hold onto the cable. Well, things went south and that bucket started rocking. And so Bowman and another man uh, were thrown off the bucket and they fell down the shaft and were killed. And Bowman was 16. Um, uh, one of the Strum boys um, was a tool nipper in the Southwest mine, and he was badly crippled at 16. Um, he was riding a cage, and again, he had a piece of equipment, and luckily, he got caught right at a shaft station, and he was drug out of the cage, but he was not crushed to death like most of the people killed on cages or dismembered he he actually survived it um and uh he so two one 16 year old was killed at least one 16 year old was was badly uh crippled and then uh, charles huber as we mentioned earlier was killed right after uh but most of the other people were were you know adult men although at this time that would have been considered an adult man uh, as far as mining was concerned. You can see some of the uh, safety photos that were I was talking about earlier. These are from a little bit later. They're probably 1920. You know, this guy over here is getting ready to turn on an airline and uh, it shoots a piece of gunk and hits his partner right in the eye. Um, so this is a common type sequence. You know, they, they were all staged. Uh, Another one would be a guy having a conversation and they have the conversation in a wrong spot, like underneath a raise and then a rock or a drill steel falls down and purportedly hits the other guy. And, and they were just showing examples of things that could go wrong. And they were based on things that did go wrong. They also included things that were a little bit more subtle, like um, you can see you have a bootleg here, which is indicating a, a misfire. And then you can see the, uh, the paper from the dynamite wrapper being exposed right there. Now underground, this one actually would have been a little harder to detect. You know, you just can't see this big bump of rock that is commonly left. Uh, 
But that should have been a good indicate here. The other thing is you have to understand that this hole right here was probably buried uh, from the rock that had been blasted. And so when they started shoveling out this rock here, I would doubt if they knew that was there. They didn't know it until it was completely cleared out. Uh, this one they would have probably known about. But if you're shoveling the, the rock out there, as long as you're paying attention, it shouldn't have been too bad. But this one could have been quite the surprise. Uh, and definitely would be a surprise if you were drilling. I have little doubt that would detonate if you drilled into it. Uh, another common uh, uh, safety photos, this one with haulage. You know, this guy's about to get pinned up against this post. Uh, real common way. It really messes up your back, uh, particularly with the larger mine cars. And then this guy's going to get caught in between the, the two cars. He uh, shouldn't be in between there when he's uh, coupling those cars. A lot of guys lost their fingers that way. And then again, uh, as I mentioned, they, they took site uh, photographs of the uh, actual sites. We have uh, where Chris Vidalic was killed in the sack on the 1600 level. Now understand that it took uh, 24 hours to get his body out of here. And this this does not look like a, a safe area to work. And that's because after it caved in, the guys rescuing or recovering the body in this case, um, they just had to throw timber in to, uh, to just make it temporarily safe to recover their body. And you can see this broken timber really weakly uh, supported by this post in the back. And this is keeping that post vertical. So they just threw in some timber so they could get, recover his body. And it took over 24 hours to, to get it out because they thought he was alive because this was a um, jumbled mass of timber. Uh, and so they were hoping he was protected by this timber, but he, but it was, he wasn't. He had been crushed. This one right here, I'm not positive on, but I'm about 90% there is where Perry Riley Bird was, was killed. And this is right off, this would be right off the Sunrise Station. So it's in the Southwest Mine. And some of you have seen the Sunrise Shaft up on the hillside. And you can see the massive size of this boulder. It was part of 100 tons that fell. And then you have the arrow pointing to where they recovered him from. Uh, but interestingly enough, they took him out through the sunrise. He he was killed instantly, but um, they uh, the sunrise of the hill goes down to the mine tour or the Queen Tunnel, as it was known then. And they dropped him and, and brought him out the uh, Queen Tunnel uh, and then took him to the mortuary. The School of Mines. And that happened in what today is our Queen Mine Tour in the upper levels of the Czar. We can see the Czar shaft. This is, well, the parking lot for the Queen Mine Tour is right there. And every once in a while, the Czar will give them some fits and start settling and sinking. And the Queen Mine Tour entrance is actually right here. Um, they were later to pour a big concrete wall here. And they wanted people to mine the Bisbee way. Okay, it didn't matter where you come from or how much experience you had. You had to go into the School of Mines, which was an active mine. They were doing real mining. Uh, and they trained you uh, in those ways, in, in the way Bisbee did it. And you, you learn things like how to get around the mine. Remember, Bisbee has 2,200 miles of underground workings. So even in the very early years, you had a couple hundred miles of workings to work through. And... Trust me, that can be very confusing. Now, they did pretty good at, at doing things like posting signs after the 1920s. But in the early years, they didn't have that. So at least the way I was trained is you would look at a switch. And these are the points off of a switch. They point out. And they always will, <coughs> excuse me, either point out or they point towards the surface or an exit would be a better way a main shaft to get out they they always do and so if you ever get lost you just look at their switch points and it will tell you the way out another thing that they would have been training and and like here these guys are doing something that would have got them in a lot of trouble and again this is a safety photo you see all the tools and junk in front of them 
and then there's timber behind them, they have not allowed themselves a way to run for protection. Okay, they're changing this timber out, uh, which if you've never changed timber out, that can get pretty exciting. You can get a lot of rock moving uh, when you're working on timber. And a lot of the time it's intentional. You're relieving the weight off of it. But you definitely need a place to go to. So this would have uh, been a something that would get you chewed out underground. So they were training them in little techniques like that, uh, just getting familiar. And if you were brand new to mining, you know, you they were considered safer areas than than, let's say, uh, some of the deeper levels of the sack and gardener and, and spray. And they were definitely not nearly as miserable because uh, uh, these areas were well ventilated and cool areas of the mine. So it would have been a nice way to break in, not the really hot areas that would be exposed later. And they kept on pushing the, the safety. This is also right at the Queen Mine Tour. The Queen Mine Tour entrance would be right off the side here. And this is the Southwest Mine Crew. And um, you can see they have their little wire safety glasses. Uh, before they had really good safety glass, they put they made their safety glasses out of thin wire screens. And you just, uh, you could see through them uh, with, of course, some obstruction. But it prevented most any rocks from coming into your eyes. And they were obviously very popular because a good number of the guys are, are actually wearing them. They also did a lot of safety incentives, particularly in the in the 20s when it was really belt buckles and safety pins and, and wallets. Um, it got to the point where being a safe miner was part of a miner's pride. You know, that meant not only were you safe, but you were a good miner. A good miner is a safe miner. And so that was a big push. Uh, and definitely with the miners from the, from post-World War II, they definitely believed that, that a good miner was a safe miner. Uh, they also believed, and they're right on this, that men are killed in safe areas, not dangerous ones. And of all the accidents I looked up, there were only three that the guys suspected that they were working in a dangerous area. The other 350 plus guys were killed in areas that they thought were safe. Yeah. And then that's true. You get relaxed in a safe area, but in a dangerous area, you are definitely intent on everything that's going on. You're listening to every Creek, every st uh, stream of dust falling down. Yeah. You are paying close attention. And, and so in a sense, it makes a lot of sense. The other thing that they did, which is remarkable, and I'm just showing a few of these, is that they listened to their miners. And when a miner came up for with an idea, they tried it. And there were hundreds and hundreds. These are two that lasted a long time. And some of you probably know the Frosco family. Um, a very important Bisbee mining family. Well, Bert Frosco did something which undoubtedly saved a large number, hundreds of serious injuries, and I would imagine guys killed. He invented the Frosco board, and you can see two of them right here, hanging above a, a chute in the or a raise in the uh, hole. And then there's actually a couple more here and a couple more on the side that are laying there loose. And what this does is when you're dumping these rocker dump cars, okay, if there's any dirt that sticks in the bottom or rock, and that happens all the time that car will actually swing back and dump towards you after you've dumped it it just you dump it and then the weight of it tries that car to upright itself on its own and it will swing back the most common injury is somebody would try to stop it with their hand instinctively and it breaks their hand uh but in some cases that car will go completely uh, the tub will go completely over and smash the guy and it has you know eight or 900 pounds of rock sitting in the bottom, it's going over with considerable force. Those boards would catch the edge of the car and would prevent that from happening. We have a spitter board, which is this board right here. And it was invented by a miner, uh, Thomas Spears. And the board, all it does is it organizes your fuse. And so you organize the shortest one to the longest one. 
and then you can light it in that order and that way you don't make a mistake and and put the first hole you want to detonate as the third hole or or something of that nature and it limits the number of phys, uh, misfires doesn't get rid of them but it, it it limits them considerably and then most of the ideas were okay we need uh, safety belts at this raise or so and so crosscut needs to be retimbered, but if you look at the Copper Queen bulletins and and then later on other suggestion notes uh, up into the seventies, you know miners were saying, "Hey, this needs fixed, or this needs looked at, or how about if we do it this way?" So far, I've avoided talking about the pit. Um, the pit was quite a shock. Uh, you know, the Sacramento pit being the first one. And they decided to mine it as an open pit. The two primary reasons being is that underground miners were extremely difficult to get. And so they just weren't available. You could use lower skilled labor in the open pit. And the other thing was, is that they hoped it would be far safer than working underground. Well, that didn't work out exactly uh, the way they thought it would. Because actually, initially, the, the pit was far more dangerous than underground. Uh, the first May accident occurred up in here in 1918. Uh, there was a misfire. And the, the thing we need to know is they were not using traditional dynamite at this time. They were using nitrostarch, which is was sold under the brand uh, Trojan Powder. And nitrous starch is typically is where they react nitric acid with potato starch or sometimes beet starch, but potato starch was a pretty common one and to make an explosive nitrous starch. And initially they thought it was going to be much safer and it turned out in Bisbee, at least it did not work out well. So they had eight guys working uh, and they were loading holes and for some reason, 13, uh, one hole with 1,300 pounds of explosives detonated. They had no clue why it detonated at the time. Um, it killed four men and, and injured several others. In the years later, they suspected that maybe when they poured the nitrous starch into the hole, it um, caused sparks with the quartz. I'm not necessarily feeling that i wonder myself if there was a chemical reaction um, some people don't realize this your explosive can chemically react with the rock and it could have detonated either that way or um there was a detonated or the temperature raised in the hole from chemically reactive with the rock either there was a direct chemical reaction that, that set it off or the temperature raised. I've, I've only had that ever happen in personal experience one time. I was distantly involved with a project where they were uh, using an old mine to test uh, equipment for a nuclear blast. And they were, it was a small open pit, much smaller than the sack pit even. And they had loaded the holes with ammonium nitrate and the ammonium nitrate reacted with the magnetite um, inside the drill holes and it prematurely detonated uh, and it caused quite the explosion. Um, now nobody was killed because they they had uh, they had been monitoring the temperatures in the holes which had gone to a critical level. Um, but it makes sense that iron oxide uh, would react. I mean it is an oxidizer. Uh, uh, in the laboratory you use it as a well, you can make basic thermites with uh, the iron oxides like magnetite. So another problem they had in the, the sack pit, and even to a lesser extent, the uh, um, lavender pit was blasting. And this is a, a view in of the uh, sack pit. The first, it hadn't blasted. You can see the initial detonation up on the peak. And then you can see this right here. Because they were unfamiliar with um, 
blasting, open pit blasting. The Copper Queen um, had some issues uh, with, with the Fly Rock. Uh, you can almost, I'm surprised why the people in the foreground didn't get beat up or killed, because many people were. Uh, in one case, there's a rock from a blast went all the way into Jiggerville and went through the roof of a barber shop and hit the guy in the chair uh, and right on the head. And he was seriously injured. Another case, uh, e, uh, Mr. E. Crump, uh, a, a rock flew, went through the sheet metal building and killed him on the uh, Sacramento mine, the underground mine, not the open pit mine, uh, which was about a quarter mile away. And it was regularly, they would lose windows and, and rocks would go through roofs, uh, the fly rock. And so they, it took a while for them to get an understanding of how to blast in an open pit mine because you're, you're blasting such huge quantities of rock. Um, and so they were just making these great big blasts and uh, they really didn't need to. What they needed to do was more break it up and just lift it a little bit. And they wanted to avoid fly rock, but that was a learning process. And they had tried to avoid it because I, uh, what they did do for the uh, Sacramento pit is they hired a, a large percentage of their, their miners for the pit from the mine at Santa Rita. And then their supervisors came from various other open pit mines. Like there was one up in Nevada. Uh, and they also stole some from, uh, the mines in uh, at Santa Rita become bosses and things of that nature. So the Sacramento mine actually was far more dangerous initially than the underground mine. Uh, and then it, it slowed off. Most of them were blasting accidents. Um, we can see a misfire right here. Uh, we can see a locomotive that's gone off the edge. Th these two are Sacramento pit. This one right here, uh, I don't gives you an opportunity of the environment they were working in. There's a man sitting on the on the boom of that shovel. It looks like he's operating the um, the chains on the uh, shovel door, the dipper chains. And he's, there's a chain going from him to that the dipper door. So that's what it looks like. Uh, he's working on, but he's right up there by that boom engine. And so many men lost fingers and hands, uh, but very few were killed. Uh, but there were a lot of very serious injuries uh, uh, in the pit. And then the local, by the time the sac um, lavender pit came through, the mine was in a much different position as far as safety. And uh, because and one of the things is most of the guys were inside equipment most of the time, so their chances of getting injured were much less than they were in the underground mine. I did find this picture right here of a dump truck that has gone off the berm on the east side. You can see the mill there. And then this would be the junction mine yard right over here. Um, don't know exactly what was going on here. You can't tell from this side. If the photo was taken from the other side, we could have a, a, a better indication. This pit wall failed uh, in the early 60s. Um, I think that was after this. Uh, and this is right above where all the turquoise came from. And the reason Phelps Dodge got really upset about miners collecting turquoise is they were collecting it out of an area that uh, uh, had a slope failure. The wall of the pit had failed. And so it was not a safe area. And it's very evident in the uh, photographs of the pit, particularly after or right before the wall failed. Uh, let's look at a wall fail. Oop. Okay, mess that one up. You can see this isn't the Holbrook extension. This is the south wall. This is the shallow end of the pit. This is the way it looked in December 1970. And then a few minutes later, because they were monitoring this, no one was injured or killed, but you can see a, a, a wall failure. You can see it beginning to happen. And then uh, in these slides, it was considered fairly small because it was only four and a half million tons. It's hard for me to imagine four and a half million tons being small, but I think the one where the turquoise area was, was like 6.7 million tons. Uh, I'm starting to wonder, and some of you probably know this, as you're driving around the pit, there's that really sharp dip. Well, that could be 
uh, indicating that there's a, a potential wall failure, or so they'll need to be monitoring that. Uh, it what causes these typically is that underneath the bottom of these is underground mine workings, and so here were stopes from the gardener and the uh, spray mine, big square set stopes that weakened the bottom so it fell. Where the turquoise area, there was a big block cave stope. And then the area that I'm concerned about eventually failing is also a block cave, a big block cave stope. And this is what it looked like at the final. Uh, today, it really doesn't look like that. Of course, they've cleaned out all this rock that's in the bottom and, and they sort of built a berm across here uh, to catch it. But it's still very evident. This part up here is much deeper now. But it's still very evident uh, that that occurred uh, in that just very impressive slide. They had it timed within six minutes of it occurring. So the engineers did a superior job on that. And that's where I'm going to conclude uh, my discussion. It It's a huge topic. It's absolutely huge. You know, I wrote Seven Bells, which is somewhere around 580 pages. And, and I have another 100 pages of, of accidents uh, that I have to somehow publish or, or at least post uh, on a website so people can access them. Most people are more interested in the genealogy aspects, which is really interesting in, it, in, it, in its own. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, if you were to go to my website, which is this one right here, if you go under more, there's a section that says free downloadable books, seven bells, both editions. Uh, I would do the, the second edition. It's more far more interesting. It's free download. So you don't have to buy it. You can just download it. And most of my other books are there too. Although one of them is in an abridged version uh, to make it more website friendly. Uh, but uh, they're there for free. And then if you wanted a hard copy, I think my sister, uh, I donated several, well, a bunch of copies for my sister to sell uh, to the museum to raise funds. So, Annie, I'm ready for questions. All right. And yes, we do have uh, several copies of Seven Bells in stock at the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum. Uh, so either in person or online, you can purchase a hard copy if you're like me and have trouble with e-readers. <laughs> yeah. And for those who, who didn't know, um, I am indeed related to our presenter today. I, I am his little sister. Um, so Elsie uh, said, not a question, but he wanted to, uh, they wanted to say that I'm really enjoying this and learning more about mining. Uh, their grandfather was chief electrician in one of the mines, and uh, they never got to talk to him about his mining days. So mm -hmm. thank you for the presentation. A chief electrician is pretty high up in the mines. Yes. That's pretty established. He must have been highly skilled. Yes. And uh, Anita, uh, Anita Riddle said, I'm so pleased that the Graham family is keeping up the important history of Bisbee Alive. And this is a wonderful set of stories and great research, Richard. Oh, thank you. And so, um, and then more compliments uh, about uh, the presentation, uh, but let's go ahead and, and start in on the questions, Rich. Okay. Do you know anything about the death of Perry May Byerly in 1928 that occurred at the Sack Mine? Yes, I do. Uh, and he's buried in Bisbee, if I remember correctly. And it was the SAC underground. It's not the SAC um, um, Sacramento pit. Let me look that up. I have it right here. And you're referring to Seven Bells, correct? So he is in the book? Yeah. Uh, Okay, he was killed in a sense into something very similar to a shoot. Okay, he was um, on the 1400 level and he was working with his brother, uh, J.R. Byerly, and they were loading skips. Okay, so instead of having cages like the elevators, these are basically boxes that you just fill with dirt or, or broken ore and then you ship them to the surface and they automatically dump. So he was loading them. And 
he okay the way it works is that you have the main chute and then you have what is called a cartridge and the cartridge holds enough rock and mud or whatever you're you're hoisting to fill a skip so he was he opened the door to load the cartridge full of rock and it was full of mud and it buried him and he suffocated in the mud yeah um that one does have a um um a coroner's inquest that is available at the uh in phoenix at the at the state archives and i cannot uh remember the name of the building it's something bomb but no and and that would give a lot of detail uh on now because of its late date um I think up into the early 20s, like 1921, they're all digitized or on microfilm. This one, uh, if looking at the date is probably, you would need to look at the original copy, but there will be a ton of information uh, on that, that, you know, that would might be very interesting for family research. The other thing is, uh, I'm sure the museum has some interesting things about that. Uh, uh, like in your Dugan material uh, would have information on that. Yes, and Richard's referring to our Dugan funeral home records that we have at the museum. Those are available by making an appointment uh, with myself and I can provide access to those. The next question is, did the deportation possibly reduce the number of skilled miners, thereby increasing the number of deaths in 1918? Well, one thing it did do, and I'm actually doing research on it right now, when uh, two things happened, World War One happened, and um, the deportation happened. Now, the deportation, in, as far as mining concerned, it did something significant. It stopped the development of the Campbell shaft. So the shaft down in, in Bakerville was started in 1917, but after the deportation, they had to shut it down because of lack of of uh, miners and then you lost a large percentage to world war one but that seems to be the biggest effect in in uh miners because if you look at the accidents underground these are typically old guys they, they aren't the new guys they aren't the um minor soldier miners that came in in world war one as uh as well as world war two uh, so no, I don't see a direct correlation between it and considering that the accidents are really similar when you remove the pit. Okay, you have to remove the the, the pit because it was a way different uh, type of mining and they had hired outside of Bisbee for most of those positions. As again, wanting the experience from like Santa Rita, which had been open pit mining for a number of years. Now the population of miners changed dramatically. And my brother has at the mine tour has done a lot of research on that. And uh, he's, he's looked at the employee list between before 1917 and after it's dramatically different. So we do know a lot of skilled labor left. Uh, but a lot of it was to do due to World War One. And during the final years of Bisbee's mining operations, how did Bisbee's safety compare to other major mines? Well, um, and I actually should have mentioned this, and I meant to. Um, it was it was actually pretty good because when I started underground uh, at the Sunnyside Mine in Silverton, Colorado, and this was in the about 1990, we had 160 men underground, and we were having a, a guy killed every other year. Okay. In Bisbee, you know, they had 1,200, 1,500 men underground, and they hadn't had a, at 75, they hadn't had a guy killed in four or five years. Uh, and then I went to work at the Golden Queen. Um, now, we had about 30 guys on on the, on, on the employment, uh, and we were having, a, 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 again, a guy killed every couple of years, uh, although those were all killed on the surface. None of them were killed underground. So when I did my experience, and actually when before I did this research, when I was hanging out with 
guys like Toby and Pete, I could believe it because you looked at the the end of the you know the last twenty years of mining and it looked, didn't look bad, it looked way better than what I had been used to. Um, so I think it actually towards the end it could have easily been the safest mine in the world at that time for its size because the ones I worked in uh, their safety record wasn't nearly as good. Yeah. And so one thing that I have heard, Richard. Um, and, and not from you, mm -hmm. I don't believe, is that one of the reasons Bisbee's mines were potentially safer was because it was a hard rock environment, that heavy hard rock you were talking about, as opposed to those soft mines like coal mines. Is there any validity to that? Mm, yeah, but the other thing is, is coal's light. So a 200 pound chunk of coal is pretty darn big uh, versus uh, where I think you, you see the difference between coal mines and um, and the soft rock mines versus the hard rock mines is not the hardness of the rocks, it's the mine fires. It's the mine fires that made coal mining dangerous. Okay, if you look at, at coal mines, you know, you get 200 guys killed at once. I mean, boom, they're all trapped in there, they're burning, they're suffocated. Bisbee avoided that. Okay, if you, there was an issue instant at the Congdon mine where, and a lot of people don't realize this, dynamite will try to burn rather than explode. And they accidentally dropped a candle holder into a case of dynamite and it ignited the dynamite and it burned and it burned very vigorously and it suffocated and burned several guys and they were killed. And then uh, our former mayor a long time ago, Jack Schistler, uh, was in the junction in number two crosscut, and he found uh, a guy who had been exposed to the uh, Campbell mine fire gases, uh, and that guy died. Uh, he tried to resuscitate him, and then actually, if I remember correctly, Jack passed out himself, uh, and uh, they were able to to remove uh, both of them. Jack survived, and the, the guy he was trying to rescue did not. So we only had two, uh, or like four killed in fire related and, and the dynamite burning is not a traditional mine fire versus uh, well, look at Bisbee. The largest accident that occurred in Bisbee was four men killed and underground was three men killed. The four men killed in the sack pit was the biggest. And then there were three men killed in the Southwest mine, uh, just off the mine tour area um, uh, at once versus yeah, mine fires are just horrible. Uh, and and that's what makes the big difference. It's not necessarily the machinery or the caving in. It's the uh, the cave-ins underground in a metal mine or, or hard rock mine are probably worse because the rock weighs so much. Yeah, a boulder reaches a ton very quickly. Well, we've received more compliments from, from Christine, and we've also received a compliment um, regarding your presentation from Kelly. Thank you, mm -hmm. ladies, so much for that. Um, I would like to encourage folks to please visit bisbeeminingandminerals.com. The website um, has an immense amount of information, uh, as you might be able to read on the screen there from uh, Bisbee history, Bisbee mining history and geology has a little bit of everything with um, a numerous um, free items to download and to um, learn about. So with that, Rich, I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you, Annie. You have a nice afternoon. And thank you so much to our audience for joining us. Again, Seven Bells is available on the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum website. And I hope all of you join us again on May 4th for our program surrounding Camp Naco. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.